For growing numbers of white Britons, fantasies about hot interracial sex only made them want the real thing. The empire was moving into Africa. For many of the British colonial officers posted there, the temptation was going to prove too much. African women saw benefits in having relationships with local white men. If relations between white men and black women were causing anxiety, it was as nothing compared to the big fear that black men might have sex with white women. Other culture. Why were relations between the races so forbidden and yet so sexually charged? In the 1850s, the British Empire was in turmoil. In India, the natives were rebelling against British rule. The mutiny, as it was called, was crushed. But the way the British viewed non-white people changed forever. After the mutiny, Asians and Africans would have their own separate development, do their own thing. You wouldn't try and turn them into Europeans. So that distance, that difference, was a crucial thing. Over time, that really worked itself into the fabric of empire and ended up in an attitude of domination and superiority. Central to the empire's new governing philosophy was one simple rule. Don't sleep with the natives. Sex reduces everyone to equality. If you have sex with someone, you can't pretend to be their master or their mistress in quite the way that you can. If you don't, it is too subversive. Um, it causes too many difficulties. But the very act of forbidding interracial love only served to make it more enticing. At the same time, these others exert a powerful fascination. Now that becomes the area in which fantasy flourishes. A whole realm of fantasy connected with the figure of the exotic, um, the oriental, the negro. Increasingly, ordinary Victorian couples were using racial fantasies to spice up their sex lives. In 1854, Parlour maid Hannah Chadwick met Arthur Mumby, an outwardly respectable middle class lawyer. They fell in love, married secretly, and lived together, although never openly as husband and wife. But there was more going on than meets the eye. Behind the curtains of London's Six Big Tree Court, they shared an intense fantasy life built around elaborate, racially charged sex games. The Victorians were not as vanilla as they're made out to be. A lot of them seem to have included, shall we say, role-playing, and also, I think, things to do with dominance and submission. So, for example, we see Mumby, who was an extremely keen photographer, photographed Hannah dressed up as an upper middle class lady, as a milkmaid, complete with sort of churn and bonnet. Stripped to the waist and blacked up as some kind of a slave wearing a leather thong uh, around her wrist and a leather collar around her neck. Slavery had ended by 1838, but it left traces in the society in terms of um, imagery of sadomasochism. They're playing out what used to be real and brutal and cruel and barbaric in the plantation but they're doing it without the attendant realities of plantation life. It's not being translated into, into real action in terms of sort of racial su superiority and inferiority. So why not? You know, why not? Luckily for us, Arthur and Hannah kept diaries of what they got up to. Their games revealed just how central interracial sex had become in the erotic imagination of their day. Coming home at 2.30, I went down into the kitchen, and there I found my Hannah, in her dirt, looking like a chimney sweep. I'm blacking myself, Martha, said she, and still she looked noble, even in rags, in dirt, in the kitchen. He looked at her, 
a Juno carved in coal, with lustrous eyes and firm devoted soul, goddess within, magnificent and brave, yet outwardly a negress and a slave. One of Hannah's terms for Arthur was matter, and if we put this with the game of blacking up, the game of wearing a leather thong or a leather collar, we can imagine that Hannah and Arthur are playing out an erotic relationship in dominance and submission, which draw on their differences as man-woman, as employer-employee, but also a fantasy which is a racial fantasy of racialized slavery. In her later years, Hannah moved away to a country cottage where she lived into her 70s. The parlor was reserved solely for Arthur's visits. It must have been spotlessly clean. I would imagine that in parts of Britain today where um, people of color are not visible, fantasies probably still exist and there are probably all kinds of interesting games going on in suburbia. But they could never be as exciting as in the Victorian period because that initial excitement of discovering the new world and the new bodies of the new world, uh, that has not gone. I think the Victorians had it good in terms of the facility that they had to enact their sexual desires. For growing numbers of white Britons, fantasies about hot interracial sex only made them want the real thing. To do that, they had to travel abroad, where a whole new world of erotic possibility was opening up. The empire was moving into Africa. For many of the British colonial officers posted there, the temptation was going to prove too much. By the end of the 19th century, Britain was taking over large swathes of Africa, including today Zimbabwe, Kenya and Uganda. The carve-up had a side benefit. Interracial desire could at last become a reality. For some of Britain's colonial elite, a posting to some far-flung dominion might not be quite so hellish after all. You could almost think of it as a sex safari. It's almost like going to Mars, to a different planet, and finding out your astonishment and delight that the people were not just naked, but uh, the, they seemed to be welcoming at a sexual level, and more than that, you had power over them. It, it was a new world of sexual adventure. They knew they shouldn't, but they did. Typical of the new breed of administrator was Richard Minotargan, a 24-year-old British officer who arrived in the East Africa Protectorate, now Kenya, in 1902. Brought up a strict Christian, he believed in sexual restraint. He'd taken on board the Empire's cardinal rule, no sex with the natives. However, Minotargan was shocked to discover that the taboo was being broken extensively. Richard Minotargan discovers that all his brother officers appear to have African mistresses. There's definitely sexual relations going on. And Minot Hagen writes about these in his diaries and appears quite outraged by what he sees. On my arrival here, I was amazed and shocked to find that they all brought their native women into the mess. The talk centers around sex and money and is always connected with some type of pornography. Being very junior, I cannot do much about it. Soon after arriving, even Minot Hagen came perilously close to succumbing to the temptation on offer when he witnessed an erotic tribal dance. For a reserved young Brit, it must have been quite an eye-opener. The natives gave us a treat. A large party of young men and girls danced together for many a hot hour. To my mind, the dance was the most suggestive and immoral. I imagine the origin of all dancing is to incite or, or play on the sexual senses. In the dances I witnessed this afternoon, the last phase is the bolting of the lady into the bush, hotly pursued by the young man. 
a direct assault on my senses. Minor Targan resisted the temptation throughout his five-year stay in Africa. But many of his fellow officers lacked his self-restraint. And it seems African women were often attracted to the colonizers as well. In certain African societies, whiteness is a blemish. In others, whiteness is just something to marvel at. When white people went, the natives fell on their knees and worshipped them <laughs> uh, as, as divinities. So obviously, whiteness had a glamour and a sense of marvel. African women saw benefits in having relationships with local white men. They're not in these relationships because white guys are seen as sexier than black guys. In the archives, you get reports of African male elders saying to white administrators, you white men have taken all our women. Well, of course you will have done, because you have the power. And it's part of the way in which the African societies have been constructed that more powerful men have access to more women. But it wasn't just about power. African women had a freer, less restrained attitude to sex. A lot of what's going on in Europe is to do with controlling sexual desire. And a lot of what's called sexual morality is actually the policing of desire. Now, in African communities at the same time, there is no real interest in policing desire. There is an interest in policing sexual relationships in order to make sure that children are born appropriately, that lineages continue, but desire itself is treated in a much more pragmatic way. Sex is fine, sex is good, sex is celebrated in these societies. Girls are encouraged to learn techniques to make sure that they and their husbands have a good time when they're having sex. You cannot regulate desire. We have records of African men saying this repeatedly to white administrators. You cannot police desire. London was a long way away, and the colonial office had loftier matters to pursue. They turned a blind eye to their minions' interracial affairs, hoping to keep it quiet from the public at home. There was plenty to keep quiet about. In some cases, sex with the natives meant sex with children, as young as 13. There is the view that forbidden fruit is unblemished fruit. What Africa seemed to have offered to jaded appetites was the possibility of virgin flesh, new flesh, you know, flesh that had not yet been um, sullied by contact. But by 1908, a scandal was brewing, which would blow the secret into the open. A white landowner in Kenya, W. Scoresby Routledge, objected to colonials having sex with young local African girls. Routledge complained to colonial officials, but they continued to look the other way. In frustration, he wrote a furious letter to the Times denouncing the immorality he had witnessed. The secret of interracial sex in Africa had just become a public scandal. Routledge made this a truly public issue, took it out of the private domain of the corridors of Whitehall and into the public arena. So questions were asked in the House of Parliament, and in one sense, I suppose, the cat was let out of the bag. The government's policy of don't ask, don't tell was in tatters. A circular went out to all colonial officers banning relationships with the natives. But with the secret out, a new public mood was taking hold in Britain. If relations between white men and black women were causing anxiety, it was as nothing compared to the big fear that black men might have sex with white women.
It was called the Black Peril, and it stalked the Victorians' imagination. At the height of Black Peril scares, an African needs to do little more than bump into a white woman in the street to be accused of attempted rape. But were the scares based on fact or fiction? In October 1908, Mrs. Janet Faulkner took her dog for a walk in the town of Umtali in what was then southern Rhodesia. Miss Faulkner left uh, her place of work to go home after dark. She thought some person had jumped at her from behind and then she alleged attempted to rape her. The next morning, a local African man was arrested for the assault. The High Commissioner, Lord Selborne, ordered an investigation into the case. It was eventually discovered that one of the local African retainers at the railway station had a pet baboon. And that on the evening of the attack on Mrs. Faulkner, the pet baboon had escaped. Its handler had given chase and had seen the baboon jump upon Mrs. Faulkner and hit her. The reason for the baboon attacking Mrs. Faulkner was that she had a small dog with her, and the baboon was afraid of the dog. Police later investigated all the cases of assault on white women between 1895 and 1920. They found fewer than one actual case every two years. In other words, a white woman had far more chance of being assaulted in the East End of London than she ever did in Kenya. But of course the knock-on effect of black peril scares is that the sexually predatory black man gets deeply embedded in the white psyche. And that has an impact, regardless of what African men are actually doing. We have that image of the black man looming over the vulnerable white woman. Back in Britain, the mythical black peril was creating moral panic. Now black men had to be kept apart from white women at all costs. But white women were proving harder to control. Victorian period, for a white woman to sleep with a black man was not bad, it was disgraceful. It betokened a kind of a, a, a profound and moral impurity. People would have been physically disgusted, in public anyway. But in private, they would have loved to be hiding onto the bed see what was going on in the bedroom. In 1899, this taboo around interracial love was about to be broken. The savage South Africa show had arrived in London. Topping the bill was a troupe of strapping black actors reenacting the African wars of the 1890s. Britain had seen nothing like it before. Semi-naked, black flesh on show. It was the hottest ticket in town. And 30,000 people flocked daily to Earl's Court. Many of them were women. And it wasn't military history they were interested in. This is a society where it's very unusual to see naked male bodies in this way. And it began to be noticed that large numbers of white women were going in and associating with the word with the Africans there becoming too intimate with them, and this caused considerable alarm. Today, women still go to strip shows and fall and scream and, and, and try to pull off people's uh, underpants and so on. In the Victorian period, there was no other forum for them to express their own inner desires. Going to the African shows was certainly one legitimate way 
that women could quietly enjoy the possibilities of illicit and forbidden sex, where they could see black bodies naked, glistening, feathered, and phallic. The sensation of the show was Peter Lomgula. He was a warrior with a noble demeanor, a stunning physique, and a great way with feathers. He became an instant sex symbol. Peter Lomgula is an enigma. He was a mission educated, and he had, if you like, acquired the ways of the white man. He had ceased to be, uh, in the when South African terms, a raw kappa, as they were called at the time. He identified with white values and white culture. He had become a huge star in this white arena. Two months after the show had come to town, a rumour began circulating London. Peter was getting married. The news caused a scandal because he was marrying a white woman, Kitty Jewell. The daughter of a Cornish engineer, she was a respectable and attractive woman in her early twenties. Kitty is obviously remarkable. She's going against all the norms of her society. Going with Peter is part of her uh, gesture of self-liberation. And of course there would have been sexual excitement on her part of being with somebody from a different culture. Kitty inaugurates a whole tradition which is still at life today of white girls going off with black men against the norms and the expectations of their communities, of their families, etc. Kitty and Peter's relationship was a tempestuous one, full of arguments and reconciliations. But it was also a passionate one. Kitty called Peter her demon. Kitty broke another Victorian taboo, sex before marriage. She moved into the London flat with Peter before their impending wedding day. I think what you can see in Kitty Jewell are elements of what was known as the new woman of the 1890s. She went where her feelings, her passions, even perhaps her sexuality took her. And that might take her in the, this sort of direction of an un, what would be regarded as an unfortunate liaison with an African. The black peril had now firmly taken hold in Britain. And the newly emergent popular newspapers, the so-called yellow press, went into a frenzy of indignation. The evening news started saying things like, there is nothing more disgusting than the mating of a white woman and a black savage. This is touching a nerve, it's touching a raw nerve. A white woman is in danger from a black man. Several priests refused to marry Kitty and Peter. Kitty's mother objected to the marriage. But the lovebirds remained undeterred. And finally they tied the knot. It seemed true love had triumphed over Victorian bigotry. But it wasn't to last. Within months of the marriage, the strain of living a forbidden love started to show. The story of Kitty Jewell and, and Peter Lomgula is rather like one of those movies about runaway lovers. There's always a point when reality descends. Kitty confessed all to a local Manchester newspaper in a classic kiss and tell. I can't stand the locals and the way the crowds of people gather around and stare at me. I had to remonstrate with them. I should have put in a glass cage and been part of an exhibition. Like many people in mixed race relationships today, society's disapproval was too much for Kitty. The marriage collapsed. Kitty's clothes and a letter were found beside a canal in Manchester. It seemed she had committed suicide. 
But that wasn't the end of the story. Two years later, she turned up in the divorce court, suing for divorce. And the judge said, what do you expect, isn't it, marrying a savage? Peter remarried, again to a white woman, and became a coal miner in Manchester, where he died. Kitty was never heard of again. The desire for a man to love and the simplicity of a human relationship was very difficult, if not impossible, for them in the Victorian period, where they, where they were constantly reminded that they were savage and civilized, that they were abnormal, you know, that they were stereotypes. It was very difficult for them to, to, to escape stereotyping. Hostility towards interracial love was mounting by the year. It was fast becoming the symbol of everything late Victorian Britain most feared. Decadence, moral corruption, and imperial decline. If you look at the literature of the period, it's riddled all the time with threat, menace, um, fear of the outsider. You know, you've got the yellow peril, you've got the black peril, you've got the muslin peril. <laughs> you have Fu Manchu. What, what did Fu Manchu want to do? He wanted to rule the world, and he wanted to kidnap young white women. Moral vigilante groups were formed to combat what was seen as the rapid moral decline. Interracial relationships came under hostile scrutiny. And in step, the National Vigilance Society, whose prying eyes were monitoring every move of the small population of African students in British cities. In 1907, Thomas Hill wrote to the Colonial Office complaining about Edinburgh student Bendali Omani. Dear Sir, regarding Bendali Omani, I'm at the present engaged in the work of undertaking to suppress as much as possible individuals in various vile activities in the public parks of this city. The above mentioned is a Negro from Lagos whose manner of life has been observed by me for many lengthy months. I know a mass of information which I must tell you. I know him to be a person who has done no work of any kind. He is addicted to sexual immorality. The whole of this summer is spent in the parks, on the hunt after women and rich looking persons of both sexes. Two weeks ago, on two separate occasions, he importuned a young girl of respectable and good position whom I know well for an immoral purpose. Hill was clearly a nosy and sanctimonious peeping Tom. But that's not how the colonial office saw it. They investigated the possibility of deporting Omani, but found he had committed no crime. Omani left Britain after he finished his education. Hill would have to find other things to do in the bushes. It shows that the level of, if you like, almost paranoia that could exist amongst some individuals or, or some organizations about the possible relationships that might develop between especially African men and British women. To see them having relationships of equality, as it were, was something which undermined this whole colonial order, a whole political order. As the First World War came and went, the moral majority was losing its grip. There was now an enemy within. White women were starting their own sexual revolution, daring to express their interracial desires. The key to understanding this new mood lies in some of the popular novels women read. They were called desert romances. Later immortalized in Rudolph Valentino films, they were full of hot, dusty, interracial sex. Sadly, they are all now out of print. Her heart was given for all time to the fierce desert man, who was so different from all other men whom she had met. A lawless savage who had taken her to satisfy a passing fancy and treated her with merciless cruelty. He was a brute. She loved him for his very brutality and superb animal strength. 
a man of different race and colour than native. These desert romances depict an Arab of the Sheikh who is presented as highly sexually desirable but also brutal and often very sexually demanding. And the heroine of these novels is a young, beautiful English woman. One crucial feature in all these is that she's sexually inexperienced, and he awakens her sexually. I think part of the attraction of these racially other men was the contrast to the returning white British man coming back from a war, which they have won, but yet they are often very defeated in spirit, they are often psychically, if not psychologically damaged. This racial other is not weakened and enfeebled by war. He stands sort of right outside all that. But white women weren't just fantasizing about black men. An increasing number were in relationships with them. And a backlash was building. White men were getting angry. Very angry. It was 1919, and a long hot summer of riots against interracial love was about to erupt. By the early part of the 20th century, an estimated 20,000 non-white immigrants had settled in Britain's old port cities of Liverpool and Cardiff. Largely made up of African and Caribbean seamen, it was a community that was to grow rapidly. It's the first time, really, that ordinary, say, working-class white people are in contact with blackness in a real way, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a living way, in an actual way. But I'm sure that it also generated excitement in the minds of white women for this possibility of a new experience, a different experience, which is at your doorstep. Around Britain, interracial love thrived, producing mixed-race households. In Cardiff's Tiger Bay, Lancashire lass Agnes Jolly and Caribbean seaman James Augustus Headley were falling in love. My mother's mother lived in a convent. She was a rather shy woman. At first she was a, oh, I can't go to Tiger Bay, you know, but she went there. And when my grandmother saw her, my grandfather, and he saw her, that was the beginning of a romance, and they, became, they married, and my mother was born. That was around 1909. Agnes and James Augustus used all their savings to set up home. They would eventually be married for more than 30 years, until Agnes died. But mixed-race love like theirs was causing anger and anxiety amongst white men. I think white men were, were very disturbed when they saw white women with, with black men. And this particularly the case, of course, in, in 1919, when white British men have been demobbed, are coming back, finding not only that they have no jobs, but that their, quote-unquote, women are having relations with black and Chinese men. a sexual threat. It's a threat to your own sexuality as a white man. You know, perhaps your wife will will have a different kind of performance with the black man and get ideas. She might get ideas, you know, as to what real sexual pleasure is. And then I, as a white man, maybe I, I will not be able to satisfy her anymore. It really is a threat to my own personal sense of potency, you know, if I were a white man. Unloved, disenfranchised, jobless. White men took their anger to the streets in the first race riots of the 20th century, targeting mixed-race couples. Around Britain, five people would be killed. Hundreds more would be injured. In Cardiff's Tiger Bay, Neil Sinclair's grandmother was about to feel the full force of the mob. My grandfather had 
to escape out of the back of the house while the house was being attacked. My grandmother and my mother watched their front door being broken into and the house being ransacked. All my grandmother's treasured possessions and china ornaments, their cozy little home that was being destroyed. They didn't actually harm my mother, who was a black child, uh, but they did beat up my grandmother, who had the audacity to marry a black man. The following day, um, the police told my grandmother it was her fault because she married a black man, that all this had happened. It was a, a dreadful experience uh, for my grandmother because she kind of never came out of it. Uh, it, was, it was traumatic, uh, and uh, she became sort of somewhat introverted for the rest of her life after that experience. The sad thing really is that in fact the black men were not uh, walking fallacies, in fact they were husbands. They had ordinary romantic relationships with white women that sometimes translated itself in terms of marriage. So they weren't kind of figures of potency. They were just they were just ordinary people. The riots subsided towards the end of 1919. But in their wake, the debate over controlling interracial desire continued. In 1928, the Chief Constable of South Wales, a senior member of Britain's establishment, voiced what could be a final solution, apartheid. The day may come when public opinion will awake to the fact that our race has become leavened with colour to such an extent that it calls for action. Parliament may be urged to consider the desirability of bringing into existence in this country legislation similar to that which has been found necessary in the Union of South Africa. The Chief Constable was saying, well, yes, that, that the black people are a problem. Um, and one of the ways in which the problem is that they form relationships with British women uh, which are uh, not acceptable and that they produce children, uh, children of this mixed origin or dual heritage as we'd say today, uh, who at the time were considered a, a social problem. The idea of apartheid never took off. For most people, it was just unworkable. As Britain headed into a new era, interracial love continued to thrive. Nothing, it seems, could control it. The Victorians had tried, with their scares, taboos, and moral vigilante squads. Even mob violence wasn't enough. You can't legislate for the kind of relationships that people want to engage in. Clearly there have been laws in openly racist states such as South Africa, Nazi Germany, but even those laws have not been able to prevent people falling in love. From now on, interracial love would be out in the open. With growing numbers of black people arriving from the colony, it was no longer something white Britons could refuse to deal with. What the history of empire has taught us, as it were, is that there's always been this constant struggle on the part of black people and white people to throw off and discard the kind of pernicious and destructive stereotypes which prevent love. You know, I think that, that there is now the possibility that people could, could escape their stereotypes and actually just fall in love in a simple human way. And, and be attracted to each other, not on the basis of racial, um, racial imagery, but on the basis of other human qualities. But old stereotypes die hard, and new ones come along. Have we really put Victorian attitudes behind us, or are we still haunted by the ghosts of our past?